if this is the case for the binary candidate we found. Here we have a variation of the Hertz from Russell diagram from the previous slide called a color magnitude diagram. The color on the x-axis is a proxy for tem temperature, and the magnitude on the y-axis is a proxy for luminosity. The pink star that you can see marks the two-mass object we found that is binary, while the black star on this diagram shows the single star that we that we displayed. The rest of the points on this graph are similar stars, are similar stars of this same association as the other two. We can see here that the binary star is on the brighter side of the main sequence. Some additional work we could do is by using the spectroscopic data to determine the masses and brightness of the individual stars that are part of this binary system then we could better classify them and the other stars related to them, all in a similar group, by updating this graph with their true characteristics. Now here are our acknowledgements. Thank you to everyone who attended our presentation and supported this work. We'll take questions now. the star is moving in our line of sight from the wavelength shifts in the spectral lines. When an object is moving away, it is red shifted, and if it is moving towards us, it is blue shifted. If we see this red and blue shifted pattern, we can tell what we can tell that a star is in an orbit. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so if we can notice that pattern of the red and blue shift, then we know that it keeps on coming towards us and going away from us in that orbit. All right, so any more questions? Yes? Do you know how long it takes the stars to go around each other? Um, I'm not sure because we didn't cover that, but I think... It likely... It likely um, this is likely different on each set of binary stars depending on their size and their system size. Alright, so any more questions? Alright, thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? No? Other questions? All right. Well, moving out, hanging around one of these stars that uh, we just heard about might be an exoplanet. And so our next group, come on up on is our exoplanet group. Okay, so up first, um, this, our, uh, this is our uh, exoplanet group, and Annika Anchetta um, is a returning student. You've been to High Star how many times? N times. She's an nth, ret nth time returner. Um, she's done a lot of work with uh, mostly galaxies, but wanted to try something a little bit new this time. Holden Suzuki, uh, he's a uh, shall we say, a little bit well-known for uh, looking at, uh, at, uh, at satellites. He's done quite a bit of satellite work and done some really neat stuff with that. And he's a returning student 
He's an n plus one returner, if Annika is a, uh, uh, an n returner. And uh, Dominique uh, Rice is a new student, also wanted to get in on the excitement of exoplanets. So I will turn the time over to them. Okay, thank you so much. So this is our project, Why Are Some Giant Planets So Giant? So thank you so much to our awesome mentor, Nick Saunders. I'm Holt Suzuki. This is Dominic Rice, and this is Annika Cheta, and this is our project. Okay, so first of all, what is an exoplanet? Um, an exoplanet is basically any planet that's not in our solar system. Much like our solar system, there are different types of planets. There's two main ones. There's terrestrial planets, which are rockier ones, like Earth or Mars. And then there's gas giants, which are big balls of gas, basically, most notably Jupiter. There's also some that are kind of in the middle, like super-Earths, and uh, sub-Neptunes, which are just more of a mix. So, what is a hot Jupiter? This is what our project's sort of focusing on. Hot Jupiters are gas giants, so like Jupiter, that are located close to their stars, making them hot. So hot Jupiters orbit their stars faster, thus they have a greater chance to be picked up on and observed through transits. Okay, so why is this important? So studying hot Jupiters is really important because, for one, they're basically large and unknown. There's not many of them, and Inside of our solar system specifically, we don't have a hot Jupiter. There's no planet like Jupiter in the inner solar system. Another one is that they provide us more information about generally how planetary systems develop. So, for example, if we can understand how a system with a hot Jupiter develops, we can kind of understand more broadly how most of them develop. And then also, because we have a Jupiter in our solar system, we have a gas giant, and it's kind of important for us to understand how gas giants operate. Okay, so we have exoplanets, we have to discover them, and we do that via transits. Now, what is a transit? An, an exoplanet transit, specifically, occurs when an exoplanet passes between a star and an observer, which would be us in this case. Um, how we detect it is it dims the light we're receiving from a star, which we can then measure that light received with a light curve, which was mentioned earlier, and is a graph of brightness over time. Um, now, exoplanet detection using the transit method, which is what this is called, is biased towards larger planets with short orbits, much like a hot Jupiter. So, here's where we got our data from TESS, our cool telescope. So, our data was sourced from the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, which we uh, kind of got a preview of in our last presentation. And we call it TESS. It's an all-sky telescope and successor of Kepler in helping us learn about exoplanets. Okay, so we kind of went into what are transits. So here's how we kind of did our transits. So we, met, uh, we kind of measured our transits around the test data, right? And we modeled it using BLS. So BLS is the box least squared method which basically takes these periods, right? You have an area where there's a transit, and then there's a gap between transits. And what the BLS method is saying is, here's the box that has the transit, how much of a gap do we have to put between each of these transits? And that's how you can kind of get periods. So there's kind of four parameters that go into making BLS, which is period, duration, depth, and reference time. So reference time is between, period is period between, and then duration is how long does the transit occur, and depth is how deep is that transit. From there, we refined it using a couple of different methods. For example, we use K transit to kind of like refine it, and in the end, this is what we got for, some of our, uh, for one of our light curves. So, how do we measure transits? Um, they can tell, first of all, they can tell us quite a lot about exoplanets, depth, which was kind of already mentioned. Um, can tell us how big the exoplanet is, we can find the radius. Um, period can tell us the distance from the star, of the planet from the star, and the planet's size and mass can give us the density. Um, using some of the models we, we discussed on the previous slide, um, uh, we learn more about them and we can calculate the characteristics. 
the most notable one would be the radius, which can be um, calculated through the formula at the bottom, which is the radius of the planet equals the radius of the star times the square root of the depth on the light curve, which is just how long from the main group to the bottom of the depth. So here are the exoplanets we measured in this project. Over the course of this project, we measured many different exoplanets. And this list of planets was narrowed down to six hot Jupiters. So we have Kelp 2ab, Korat 1b, Kepler 7b, Kepler 14b, Kepler 5b, and MGTS 1b. And over here is just a table of most of our properties for the hot Jupiters that we used in our project. So going left to right, we have our orbital period, which is basically how long it takes for one revolution around its host star. The planet radius, which is kind of self-explanatory. We use it to measure like volume and stuff. The planet mass and the planet density, which is how compact are these planets. And we also have the references for where we got the mass from. Okay, so we kind of talked about density on the last slide. Density is just mass divided by volume. It's just kind of a measure of how compact a substance is. So to calculate the density, which is rho, so on the left most side you can see rho p. So rho p is basically just the planet's density. We take the mass of the planet divided by the volume of the planet. And we got that through three masses over four pi r cubed of the planet. So r being the radius, we just took the cube of r, and we multiply that by four pi. So yeah, that's how you get the density of the planet. So, the big thing with this, about why some get so big, is planetary inflation. Which is basically, with the ideal gas law, um, assuming pressure and number of molecules remains constant, as the heat rises, the gas will expand, which leads to planetary expansion, like inflation of these gas giants. This will cause the density to lower because the um, mass to volume ratio changes. So how did we measure this planetary inflation? So first off, to measure inflation you need two things. First off, the radius to see how far the planet has expanded because you calculate the volume from the radius. And then the temperature to see how much the gas is being heated. So the radius was collected using our aforementioned transit model, while temperature was collected using our using orbital period and stellar luminosity. So as you can see from our graphic here of hot Jupiter plus more hot equals hotter Jupiter, which expands it. And then our equation for calculating the in planetary inflation. Okay, so what can we draw from this? So the dashed line, just to kind of start with our graph, is an average Jupiter. So that's just basically, it's taking the radius of Jupiter and it's just saying, hey, this is what we'd expect for all kind of Jupiter-sized planets, right? So here is kind of a version of the graph that we showed a little bit ago, but it includes our hot Jupiters, and as you can see, they kind of fit directly to the graph in the hot Jupiter section. You can see that there's kind of two groups of planets here. The kind of lower group on the graph is terrestrial planets, so planets that are more like Earth. So, for example, like, Venus, Mars, Mercury, Earth-type planets are all going to be down there. In the middle here, you can see kind of those super-Earths, sub-Neptune planets, which are kind of in the middle. They're not quite gas giants yet, but they're not tiny either. And then up on the right side, you can see all the hot Jupiters. So these are planets that are getting a lot of light, and they're being kind of excited by a lot of energy. So they're kind of growing. Their radius is growing far above what you kind of project for planets at their size. So here you can see where Jupiter would kind of show up on this. So it's way off to the left because a lot of these planets are a lot closer to their star than Jupiter is. Because it's really hard for us to uh, detect planets that are further out, as we were saying before. So basically, what you're going to be catching mostly through the transit method is stuff that's really close to the star and is more visible. 
Okay, so kind of moving on to the next part of this, you can see our kind of U-shaped graph here. So let's kind of go over what this is showing. On the bottom side, on the x-axis, you're seeing planet mass. So this is just basically saying how massive is this planet in comparison to Jupiter. This is measured in a logarithmic scale. So 10 to the 0 is 1 Jupiter. So a lot of these planets that we kind of measured are right around 1 Jupiter worth of mass. So you can see that kind of most of these hot Jupiters fall into the kind of cluster near the bottom. These are high mass, low density, sun, uh, right? So they have signs of just kind of being inflated. They have very high mass, but they're not very dense, which means that they are kind of got a massive radius. This graph also curves back up as mass increases again. This is because as kind of these Jupiters get so massive, these gas these giants just gain so much mass, they have the ability to kind of create enough gravity to condense these gases back down. So as you can see, one of our hot Jupiters actually fits into that kind of situation because it's massive. It's almost 10 times the mass of Jupiter. Okay, so after that, what are the next steps that we would do in the project if there was more time? Um, and that would be probably determining the composition of the planet, so what it's made of. Now, this can be, we can make an estimate of that based on the density of the planet, and then once we have that, we can make density based on the densities of other materials. And there's a little graph of basically what Jupiter is made of, as you can see by you see there. Okay, so continuing on with our next steps for composition, there are a few issues to this. For example, uh, planets aren't planets aren't exactly homogeneous. They're not made up of the same element all the way through, and the core is denser than the atmosphere. So obviously, there's going to be some discrepancy between like the core's density, and then when you move out, the atmosphere. And the atmosphere is also a mix of substances, though you'll likely have hydrogen and helium there. So as you can see on the graph here, like if, one, if zero is like the core core of the planet, and one is the surface, you can see that at the core, it has a very high density, high relative density, and then as it goes down like towards the surface, it decreases. So yeah. It's not homogeneous. We don't really know like exactly what's in there without making a bunch of assumptions. Okay, so there is another next step that we'd like to talk to you guys about. So this would be transmission, uh, transmission spectroscopy. So you heard a little bit about spectroscopy in the last kind of presentation where basically you can see the spectrum of different stars and of different light kind of wavelengths, and certain wavelengths can be blocked out. So what we're basically trying to do, or eventually try to do in the future, would be to kind of look at the star and see which wavelengths are being blocked by the planet, because that could tell us a lot about its atmosphere. For example, if certain elements kind of have absorption lines, such as water or carbon, we could see, hey, this planet has carbon dioxide, or it has water in its kind of atmosphere. So that is what transmission spectroscopy is kind of aiming to do. This has always been kind of an idea, and we've even used these same kind of tactics on stars with dust. So basically, if there's dust in the way of a star, we could have kind of seen what was being absorbed by the dust. But because of these new technologies, we're able to do this more readily and more availably with planets and stars. So hopefully that would be kind of the next step for us. Okay, so here's our acknowledgments. First of all, we'd love to say thank you to Nick Saunders for being an awesome mentor. Slanders. Uh, JD Armstrong and our heart, uh, High Star staff for running this great program and supporting all of us. Thank you, Slady. Uh, tech, so we'd also like to say thank you to Tess and Nexi for the exoplanet data. And Light Curve and K Transit for being awesome plots. Uh, this template was created by using SlidesGo, <laughs> Flaticon, and FreePick. And the gift credit goes to cooltext.com. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. All right, do we have any questions? <laughs> any questions? Yes. I was just a little confused on the, one of the first slides when you guys said you don't have a hot Jupiter solar system, and then you're like, but we have Jupiter. Yeah. I, I got confused again. Okay. 
So when we were talking about not having a hot Jupiter in our solar system, but having a Jupiter, what we basically meant by that is that we have a Jupiter in our solar system, and we have a gas giant, right? But we don't necessarily have a gas giant that's located very close to the sun and is rotating uh, and is orbiting very quickly. So that's kind of what we were referring to in this presentation. We do have a Jupiter, but it's not a hot Jupiter. Yeah. And if you have any questions, I guarantee you other people looking here have the same questions, so we'd love to answer it. Shoot. What makes it a hot Jupiter then? Okay, so a hot Jupiter is considered a hot Jupiter because it's located close to the star, referring to the heat, because it's being kind of heated up by the sun more, it's closer, it's getting more light, and it's orbiting very quickly. So hot Jupiters are moving very fast around their star because of their kind of relative closeness, and their heat is coming mostly from being close to the star once more. So a hot Jupiter, as we say, hot Jupiters are gas giants located close to their stars. So basically a hot Jupiter is just any uh, gas giant type, uh, type planet that is located very close to their star, their whole star. Okay, so we were very grateful. Uh, if you go back to our slide with kind of some of the different properties, we got our masses from all of these different sciences. So I'd like to say thank you to them. I mean, we obviously kind of source them, but when it goes into kind of collecting masses, it's something that we didn't really do personally on this project, so I'm not super confident about answering it. What's the second most successful way to find uh, that would be the radial velocity method. Repeat the question. The second most successful way of finding exoplanets is the radial velocity method. And the radial velocity method can help you because it can tell you how much the star is being pulled by the planet. So as exoplanets orbit, everything is kind of going around the center of mass, which the star is also a part of that, right? And obviously the star is so much more mass than the planet that it's pulling the planet way more. But everything is getting pulled in this kind of, I guess you would say, like, system, right? So as the planet orbits, it's also pulling the star. So given that kind of information, you can kind of identify exactly how much this planet is pulling, how much mass it has. This is also how we kind of identify binary star systems as opposed to just regular planets, like hot Jupiters and stuff. Because stars obviously pull on their other star way more than a hot Jupiter would pull on its star. So, this is generally how we confirm that a hot Jupiter is there instead of a star. Transits are more of a way of identifying that there's something there with the star. Yeah. Alright, any more questions? Alright, well think, oh yeah, one more, yes. So, for the transmission spectroscopy method, how do we So when gases get excited, they can either like absorb some of that energy, right? So in this case, it's absorbing the energy and it's kind of removing these specific wavelengths. So as you can see, certain materials have different kind of wavelengths that they remove, right? So for example, H2 is removing some of these kinds of uh, wavelengths. I mean, it's still relative, well, we've used this on kind of dust before, so as light comes into the dust, as it strikes it, right, some of the wavelengths are removed because it's kind of exciting this dust, and the dust is like kind of just taking in that energy. So the same thing can happen with the planet's atmosphere. This atmosphere is made of a lot of the same stuff, and as light kind of strikes it, it absorbs some of that energy, and that comes out in some of these wavelengths. Any other questions? All right, let's thank our speakers and we'll invite our next group. Last but not least, our Galaxies group. Yes. Exit stage left.
first slide. Happy? All right. Yes, probably good thing to go to the first slide. I must admit. Um, so we have two returning students here, uh, Eskin Jaran, Jaran, Jaran. Got it. Okay. Eskin Jaran. And how many years has it taken me to learn that? We'll find out when I learn it, right? Okay. So, so Eskin, is your uh, sort of a n minus one? I think is where we're at on our on our uh, Annika scale. Annika being the standard n, and Eskin is an n minus one. Um, and uh, Wilson Chow is a, an n student as well. Is that right? Okay. Um, they will be talking about galaxies, a cosmic makeover. Galaxies redshifting their style through time. Is that good? All right, I will let you take take over. You are in charge of my getting to show them how to use the mic. <laughs> All right. um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming out tonight or this evening. Um, I'm Wilson Chow. Uh, and I'm Eskin Jurek. And we also have another partner, Mackenzie. Um, she was supposed to be here. She worked a lot with our project as well, but she didn't feel very well today, so we'll be taking over her place for today. Um, and our project is a cosmic makeover of galaxies, redshifting their style through time. Uh, so just for a quick background on galaxies, there are typically three specific types that we can classify through a process called morphology, which is basically just the study of the different shapes of galaxies. And uh, these three types are a spiral galaxy, an elliptical galaxy, and an irregular galaxy, which you can see in the images up here. Um, a spiral galaxy uh, is typically a more younger galaxy and has a more blue color. Uh, just it's burning a lot brighter, a lot hotter, and it's typically a lot more star forming. That means its star formation rates are a lot higher. Uh, an elliptical galaxy is typically a lot older, a little more redder, as you can see in the images here. And um, it's typically not star forming anymore. It's kind of just sitting in space. And the irregular galaxy is kind of a cool phenomenon. It's the result of different galactic interactions. So like the merging of two different galaxies and just different uh, galaxies and their gravitational fields interacting with each other. So going into more about galaxies and their basics, um, something we want to highly emphasize is their color. And so what's so great about knowing the color of our galaxies is you can determine the composition of your galaxies by knowing its color. So especially the stars that make up the galaxies, planets, and potentially the black hole. Um, so something you should know is that hot and bluer stars are typically a lot younger, while compared to um, redder stars, which are a lot more cooler and, young, and older. And this is going to be very important later on in our presentation. So looking at our graph, you can see that um, these are just like a spectral uh, diagram that kind of tells you like how hot a temperature would indicate the color of a star. And also another thing you should know is that red stars are formed more frequently, while blue stars are a lot more brighter, but they do form less frequently. Uh, so, in relation to stars, one last just brief overview on the basics of galaxies uh, is star formation. So stars are pretty much what determines, as Wilson said, the color of galaxies. And uh, star formation is typically how a galaxy would grow uh, if it didn't undergo like another more irregular thing like merging with another galaxy. Uh, so this chart up here is actually a chart depicting the star formation. Uh, rates and tendencies of galaxies. So for the x-axis you have the number of existing stars which is basically just the stellar mass of the galaxy and on the y-axis is the number of stars forming or the star formation rates of that galaxy. And galaxies typically start out their lifetimes uh, pretty hot, like having rates of pretty high star formation in this main sequence as you can see here. And after they go through their time in the main sequence, they typically either burst into that starburst section and then drop down into the green valley or just go straight into the green valley in like towards the middle part of their lives. So they're not really star forming at such high rates as the main sequence, but they're not uh, so much as, uh, or they're not like stop star forming like the red and dead galaxies that you can see at the bottom of this chart. 
So um, in our project, this is what we're mainly focusing on is Redshift. And so something you should know about Redshift is it determines how um, the distance of an object that you're measuring compared to a blue shift, which is how close or how short uh, an object is approaching us. So noticing this, if you look on the spectrum, you can see that the regular spectrum or color spectrum has the, these emission lines that covers it. And basically what an emission lines is it's when light is, um, hits a gas in, within an atmosphere, this would, it is then scattered. And so this is what creates these emissions lines. And so whenever you see a galaxy that is continuously um, going farther out, these emission lines are then spread out into the spectrum. And it is spread out within the red spectrum. And this is where uh, the process of redshift kind of occurs. And if you see that blue shift is basically just showing us how much the um, wavelength is being compressed while the red wavelengths for redshift is being elongated. Uh, so, as Wilson was talking about redshift, uh, the higher redshift you'll have, you'll typically have younger galaxies, so these more uh, spirally galaxies, blue, uh, and then as you go into the, like, the lower redshifts, down to like redshift zero, you'll actually have a lot more elliptical shaped galaxies that are typically a lot red and they're not star forming as much. So our research goal for this project was to determine and examine the, how the average mass, star formation rates, and colors uh, change as a function of redshift. And um, redshift, like Wilson said, time equals distance, so we're just basically examining the properties of these galaxies over a function of time. So this starts off with getting some um, photometric observations or data from the Cosmic Evolution Survey, which is a survey that basically helps with classifying uh, galaxy um, properties and, galaxy, and classifications. So first we performed uh, photometry and SED fitting. We didn't necessarily perform them, but we kind of just took some data that was given us, that was given from the cosmos, and we used it within our research. So some background about what a photometry is, is that it tells us how bright something is at a certain wavelength or in a given band. So in particular, in our project, we use three different bands. One is neuro, ultraviolet, infrared, and optical. And optical is just uh, another way to say invisible light. Um, we also uh, grab some uh, met data from the spectral energy distribution, or SED, which is basically taking a few um, photometric points and then fitting it onto a model so that it helps with giving us a spectrum using those points. Uh, so, dive, so diving into a little deeper about the process of SED fitting, uh, like Wilson said, that was the process used by the Cosmos catalog that we used. Uh, that's how they actually got their data. So SED fitting, you basically take these separate photometry images like you can see on the top and you fit them to a template to actually get a spectra of your galaxies without actually having to use the process of spectroscopy, which is a lot more difficult and expensive. So it's basically just an easier way to obtain our data, and um, it's the process, like I said, that we used, or that the survey we used in this project uh, performed. So given this, um, we started off by filtering data using code from Python, and so this helped with sorting out whenever um, in the galaxy, whenever, the galaxy is always expanding, and so whenever you're trying to grab more observations further out, um, the resolution or the uh, quality of those images are a lot worse. And so we kind of just factored out parts that we believe would not be detrimental to our results. And so that's what we did with using IRA Channel 1 and 2 from Spitzer, which is a telescope um, that we kind of got our data from. So when we first wanted to start looking at the effect Redshift had, uh, we actually found, or we found, or we came up with this distribution of the redshift in our data set. And as you can see in this graph, it is significantly skewed towards the left-hand side of this graph. So this graph is basically just showing that within the lower redshifts, you actually have a significantly higher concentration of galaxies. And because we didn't want this uh, skewed graph, or the skewed redshift, to uh, or correspondingly skew our results, we decided that binning, uh, or placing the redshift into bins with smaller bins, in the lower redshifts and bigger bins in the higher redshifts so that we could um, 
just get equal sample sizes would really help to normalize our results and help to allow us to like reach the conclusions that we wanted to reach. So furthering on what Eskin was talking about with binnings, you basically kind of pinpointed down the parts that had a lot of abundance in galaxies. So if you look here on the registers from 4 to 10, there wasn't as much, and so we didn't really primarily focus on getting too much data from there. And so we kind of reduced our bins down to around 0 to 2. And this is where you kind of see most of the maximum of the graph. And so this is where we pinned it down to around 0 0.25 to 0 0.5 for our bins. And this is where we kind of isolated the parts where we really want to focus on. So for our results, uh, the first kind of results that we found were the effect of redshift on mass. And each of these lines uh, is a corresponding to one of the bins that we made for our redshifts. So like the blue uh, part of the graph would be a redshift greater than 4. Uh, the orange part would be a redshift in between 3 and 4. And that's just, it goes down the list as you can see uh, through that table. But um, these results actually showed that uh, with your higher redshifts, you're actually getting a correspondingly higher mass, which was actually the opposite of what we expected. Uh, when you're looking at these higher redshifts, you're looking at these younger galaxies that are still kind of at like the early stages of their life. They're still star forming, and we actually expected the like older uh, galaxies that have been star forming for a long amount of time to have a significantly more mass than these younger ones. However, uh, this data we found to be a result of our selection bias. Uh, when we were choosing our galaxies, the uh, higher redshift galaxies that we were choosing, because they're so far away, were typically the more luminous, the more star forming, the significantly more massive galaxies, the ones that we could see, um, which really shows uh, like how much of selection bias we have as a pretty much inverted uh, what we expected. But um, there are actually a lot more galaxies that are significantly lower massive in these higher redshifts. However, we just can't see them with our technology available. Yes, so going deeper into what Eskin was talking about, this can help us find the solar formation rate of most of the galaxies that we're, uh, we were observing. And so if you see here, um, if you remember looking back at the previous um, um, graphs with the bins, um, this is kind of like flipped. And this is due to um, analyzing the, uh, something different on the x-axis, which is um, the star formation or the log of solar masses per year. And so you can see here that the higher the, um, the z or the redshift, the more star formation is um, prominent and abundant compared to, star, or compared to stars that are uh, lower in um, z or redshifts. Uh, so for the last part of our results, uh, we were examining the effect of redshift on color. So we did the effect of redshift on color distribution for the optical band minus the near-infrared band, which is the graph on the left, and the effect of redshift on color distribution for the near-ultraviolet band uh, minus that optical band here on the right. And uh, while it may not be incredibly clear in these graphs, we found that there were trends showing that your lower redshifts actually had a redder color, which we actually expected because these lower redshifts, these older galaxies, uh, would be like sort of at the end of their uh, like star formation days. Uh, they won't be as blue and as bright and as like luminous. They'll be more redder color. And this uh, one on the right, this graph, as you can see uh, by the uh, x-axis, it's at it shows that there was actually a significantly higher change, we noticed, uh, within these two bands than the other two bands. However, they both were just showing these same trends, that lower redshift, you have a redder color, so your older galaxies will typically be a lot more redder. So here, um, going deeper into our results, you can see that um, anything with a redshift of higher than four earlier, those are a lot more younger and uh, cooler um, galaxies, and you may be wondering what is this red uh, dotted line? And this is almost like a reference point that we use to determine uh, the peak or the mark where more stars that are uh, lower and a lot more redder 
are beginning to form and who are a lot more dead. And so as you can see, as you progressively uh, go lower in redshift, you can see that there is more um, abundance in um, more dead and redder stars or galaxies. Uh, so for some future research, there were a couple things that we didn't really get to touch on in this project that we thought would be really cool to look at in the future. Uh, the first one was looking deeper into morphology. I addressed that at clearly the first slide of our presentation. But we thought it would be cool if we could examine the effect of redshift on the morphology or the shapes of galaxies and see if the shapes of galaxies actually changed as a function of redshift. Because like I, like I said earlier, your younger galaxies are going to be more spirally shaped and your older galaxies are going to be more elliptical. So we're going to see kind of how that process unfolds. And uh, we also thought it'd be cool to look at active galactic nuclei or active galactic nucleuses, um, which are basically just looking at the supermassive black holes at the center of these galaxies. And to do this, we would actually use these same catalogs, except instead of looking at the galaxies in particular, uh, we would be looking at the X-ray sources uh, instead, which would kind of give us a little bit more information about the supermassive black holes at the centers of each of these galaxies, which we thought would be really cool as well. So uh, we just want to say thank you for listening. Um, we'd love to hear any questions. We're always welcome to answer them. We want to give some special thanks to um, J.D. Armstrong, our, our very compassionate mentor, Finn Giddings, and the Institute for Astronomy, the UH Institute for Astronomy, um, the University of Maui, Hawaii Maui College for letting us this campus and facility to use, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Park and Ms. Kaichi for helping support High Star all these all these years, and also Space Force for funding High Star and the Maui Economic Development Board. All right, do we have any questions? Yes. Is redshift dependent on the galaxy's age? So it's redshift dependent on the galaxy's age. Yeah. So redshift is, um, I wouldn't say in particularly uh, dependent on the galaxy's age. It helps with finding um, the galaxy's age because it tells us how far a galaxy is. And so some a reference that you can kind of use is that redshift is almost like knowing uh, well, like a, a way I would kind of explain it is that typically in galaxies, stars that or stars that are more closer to the inner circle of a galaxy is a lot more younger, and stars that are a lot or sorry older, and stars that are a lot uh, wider or like farther away from the galaxy center is a lot older. So I guess you could kind of say they help with determining the age, but I would say it's it's the exact way. And just to kind of add on to that. Um, so when you're looking at higher redshift, it's basically just telling you that you're seeing light from a galaxy. So higher redshift means uh, the galaxy is actually a lot further away. So the light you're seeing is thus uh, like a lot older. So you're seeing, even if the galaxy is old, uh, like at the current point of time, the light you're seeing from that galaxy is actually at a point where it was really young. So a like lower redshift will typically be an older galaxy while a higher redshift will be, you're looking at the light of the galaxy when it was at a younger point in its life. Uh, did that help in your understanding? So by that, do you mean you're looking back in time? Repeat that, the question. JD asked if you're looking back in time, and pretty much that's exactly what you're doing. Um, you're looking at how a galaxy looked and you're getting observations of it from a significant billions and billions of years uh, in the past, which is really, really cool. Other questions? All right, well, let's thank our speakers. Uh, for those of you who are, who are here, uh, you probably should be very glad you're, we're, you're here because we had problems with the YouTube broadcast. But 
we will piece that together and get that posted if you want to review this later and hopefully I'll be able to get that done next week or two. All right, well thank you very much.